Okay, so now we go to the downstream analysis. You start from this uh, peak by cell count matrix. And the very first step is basically each cell is one column, right? You want to kind of see the cell behavior a little bit. And so this is kind of similar to the single cell RNA-seq. We still want to do some dimension reduction to be able to look at each cell in a two-dimensional space. And so for that, you could use PCA. Remember your homework three for single cell RNA-seq, right? You can, you can use PCA because basically this is a huge matrix. And uh, because we can't have hundreds of thousands of peaks, we want to reduce the numbers for each cell to a manageable maybe 100 or maybe two. You know, you can, you can, you can decide how, how much variability you still want to capture with this matrix. So you can use PCA. Um, recently, there are some other comparison algorithms or papers that are published which found this new machine learning algorithm called latent semantic indexing to be a, a slightly better approach. Um, this was developed in order to look at the term document matrix. For example, you can imagine uh, you want to see which websites are more similar to each other or which books are more similar to each other or which newspaper articles are similar to each other. And very often that will generate a term document matrix. The terms are kind of the peaks. You know, every word in the vocabulary is a term. And uh, each document, like a website, a book, or an article, or a newspaper, whatever article, is one column. And you just ask, in this article, how many times does the word uh, Congress appear, or uh, Red Sox appear, or you know, things like that. So this is kind of a term document matrix. It's quite similar to what we are seeing here, which is a, a peak cell count matrix. And uh, so the latent semantic indexing is kind of a uh, singular value decomposition applied to the term document matrix for dimension reduction. And um, then you can co compute uh, later on using this whether two documents are similar to each other or not. They do kind of the correct normalization and make, make sure you get better results. And so there are some, it, it's almost quite similar to a, a PCA for dimension reduction. Um, and uh, it, it just in recent, um, comparisons, they seem to work slightly better than PCA. But basically, uh, between every pairs of cells, you can, you can then use the, the available vector to see how similar the two nearby cells or two, two cells are to each other. So you can calculate kind of the pairwise distance between the two cells after dimension reduction. And um, after that, the, the dimension reduction reduce the data. You can just use the standard single cell RNA seq for clustering, right? That, that's the graph based uh, uh, community identification approach in RAT3. And so that's implemented. And then you can visualize all the results using TSNI or UMAP. So again, clustering itself is not done through TSNI or UMAP. They just show you a two-dimensional plot to display this, right? Uh, this is an example of uh, a single cell experiment and you can already see the different clusters from single cell uh, taxic and this is quite by this time quite similar to a single cell RNA-seq and so you can look at the, the cells in clusters. You can imagine the original matrix are very very sparse. They might have very little overlap uh, because each cell has well, could be like hundreds of thousands of rows, and each cell only have a few thousand of those rows be being ones, the rest are all zeros. And yet they still have potentially similar overlap. Um, then you can look at their similarities. Um, and after we have clustered the, uh, the cells into these different clusters, there is an optional step that you can do, um, which is um, after you assign the cell to the clusters, you can look at all the original reads that are assigned to the, the cells in those clusters and the run max again to call peaks. Because um, for example, this 
cluster 16 is a tiny cluster with few cells. And so initially, if you combine all the cells together, all the reads together, you may not have enough reads to even give you a very good uh, peak call. So maybe there is a peak just for the cluster 16, but you don't have enough reads to really kind of give you a good peak call. And so after we have uh, assigned the reads into these different clusters, we can then look at all the reads that's uh, assigned to the cells in cluster 16 and just run peak calling on cluster 16. And there could be a small percentage of uh, new peaks that are discovered, which you initially mi missed in the, the bulk peak calling. And then after that, you can merge all the peaks from the, all the clusters and you can regenerate the count matrix. And so basically your the total number of rows can increase a little bit that you can potentially use later on for differential peak calling. Okay. Um, and so after that, you can do differential peak calling. So uh, for differential peak calling, um, we can use again, some of the previous single cell RNA-seq approaches. Remember, previously with single cell RNA-seq, um, people can use uh, more like a non-parametric test. For example, for man whitney u test, you just ask um, in this group of cells, in another group of cells on this peak location, do I see them being slightly different numbers? For RNA-seq, this is okay because in each cell, you do get a real transcript readout for that cell. But for single cell uh, ataxy, remember we are dealing with like a, a count matrix, um, right? So basically all you have is zero and ones. And when you compare the, you know, like this group of cell and this group of cell, it's almost just like counting how many ones or zeros you have. And to, to really overcome to having too many ties in the peak cell count matrix, sometimes you can normalize the data in each cell so that they scale up to roughly 10,000 reads per cell. So you, you make sure each thing sum up to about 10,000. That because you know some, read, some cells might have uh, a little bit more reads, some might have less reads. Um, you don't want to have too many reads, but you don't want to have too little reads. So you, you, after you do the Q, cell QC, when they are roughly in the same ballpark, you can normalize them a little bit. And this will then um, give each of those uh, cell count matrix now is no longer just zero one. It would be some kind of a normalized value. And then you can consider everything on the left and everything on the right, um, whether there is a significant difference between the, that row. Um, and recently, there is another algorithm called Presto. This was just published on BioArchive. They implemented this uh, Wilcoxon ransom test which is a thousand times faster than R. So normally when you do single cell, uh, because we have to com compare many clusters, because you are asking um, what, what is the differential enrichment of this peak within this cluster compared to anything that's not in this cluster, right? So because you have to compa compare um, for, for a single cell RNA seq test on every gene, on every cluster, for Single cell taxi, you have to cons consider every peak on every cluster. And so there are many, many of those uh, Wilcoxon rank sum tests you have to do. And uh, with this Wilcoxon rank sum test uh, implemented with Presto, I think something that used to take six hours is now only taking like 15 seconds, which is really quite amazing. Um, and so that's something uh, people are, can incorporate into their analysis pipeline for differential peak calling, okay? And so after we have the, uh, the clusters and we have called the, the differential, uh, class, uh, differential peaks, what people are really interested in, you know, you can imagine a taxi give you the collection of all the transcription factor binding sites in the cell. We probably are more interested in asking what kind of transcription factors really bind to this cell versus the other cell cluster. Let's just imagine uh, in the PBMC, um, you want to ask what are the transcription factors that are different between B cells and T cells and macrophage and dendritic cells, right? Different, those different immune cell types. 
And uh, that, that, that's why you do a tag seek in the first place. You're wondering you know, whether there are different transcription factors that bind to those different regions, which are the reason for differential gene expression. And so um, the, one of the earlier algorithms um, developed is called ChromeVar. This was developed in the group that invented the uh, attack seek technology. Um, and so they collected a few hundred of the known transcription factor motifs. These, there are some standard motif databases. So um, they just take those uh, known motif and then ask whether a particular motif is enriched in, uh, in all the open chromatin regions in that one cell type or not. And so, uh, and then they ask whether they are enriched in, in some clusters compared to other clusters. And so, for example, um, for this transcription factor motif CEBP alpha, they can evaluate in every single cell how much this motif are on the ones. You know, remember each row is one peak. Then they ask, within this peak, do I see this motif? In the next peak, do I see the motif? In the next peak, do I see the motif? And they ask, for example, in this single cell, there might be 200,000 rows, but the, 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 the cells that have one, you know, like a, a real a read observed is probably only 10,000. And then they just ask, how much of this motif is enriched in 10,001 location? And then they ask, how much of this motif is enriched in another cell with another 10,000 rows? Um, that has one number one in, in the matrix. And so with this, you can already see, for example, this particular transcription factor motif is enriched in the open chromatin or accessible chromatin in this group of cells and kind of weak in here and also just not very enriched in the, the other two cell clusters. Right? And then you can look at another transcription factor and evaluate how much this motif is enriched in every single cell. And in this case, probably it's more enriched in this other cluster. And so um, ChromeWire basically evaluate all the transcription factors and see whether there are some transcription factors that have unique enrichment on the subsets of clusters in your single cell ataxy cell clustering. And you can display this and give you a very intuitive view of what might be important in the different cells. Okay, that's one approach. Um, uh, this is using transcription factor motifs. Uh, but of course, you know, like if you think about in the second module, we started from transcription factor motif discovery, but we know that in human genome, the transcription factor motif doesn't completely predict whether something will be binding, uh, the transcription factor will bind there or not. And so, the, potentially best approach is to look at the real transcription factor binding. And so for that, you can use another approach, which is to look at all the published ChIP-seq data. So um, within my group, we have been collecting all the publicly available ChIP-seq in human and mouse, and we collect them and process them and put them in a database called SystromDB. And this database by this time has over 60,000 ChIP-seq and uh, DNAs and uh, uh, attack-seq profiles available. And within the Systrom DB, we also have a toolkit function. This tool toolkit function has three features which might be useful for you guys. The first feature is if you are interested in one particular gene, you can ask what transcription factor is likely to regulate this my gene of interest? And it will give you some transcription factors that are really having enrichment binding near that gene. The second feature is um, if you're only interested in some interval, for example, SNP location, and you want to ask what transcription factor really binds to this SNP, it will also tell you uh, what factors are there. And the third one is what we can use now with single cell attack seek. Um, if you have say uh, a PCOL region, say you, you, you generate a chip seek or even a tax seek, you have uh, X number of peaks, right? Uh, 10,000 peaks or 100,000 peaks. You can upload this peak call as a bad file and ask in the public chip seek data, what other factors have binding that has the best overlap with my input peak list? Your peak list can be, you know, a few thousands or tens of thousands, 
or, or all the peaks you have, you can upload into the website and it can very quickly find other ChIP-seq data that are having significant overlap. And so that was implemented by another tool which just can very quickly find the significant overlap. And so you can imagine if you have open chromatin data from single cell, um, you can input either the all the you know the, the pseudo bulk. So I know this is one cluster. I just take all the reads in that. And we, I do peak out. Remember, we can run the second max run. You get all the peaks. You can just overlap or upload this into the system toolkit. It can very quickly tell you what transcription factor have significant overlap with with, with the open chromatin in this cell in this cell population. Or you can also identify the differential ataxic peak that's unique in your cluster compared to all the other clusters in this cell population. Um, that one, you can also do overlap and it will tell you what transcription factors are really rich in binding to those regions, right? So uh, it will just give you output a public transcription factor, chip seek data with the best overlap. And you can look at this, for example, this is some input data and it will show you uh, which public chipsy so um for example you know like this particular chipsy data has what well, this transcription factor might have multiple uh chipsy data um, and this is ranked by uh, the best overlapping chipsy for this factor but you do also see other ones as well right so um yeah this is the similar idea um we we can rank all the transcription factors by this Giggle score, which give you a quantitative measure of the overlap. Um, and very often, um, if you remember homework four, very often because the same family of transcription factors, for example, uh, a GATA family have GATA one, two, three, four, five, six, or um, STAT transcription factor family have STAT one, two, three, four, five, A, five, B, and so on. Very often, they recognize similar motifs. And if you look at their transcription factor binding site, they might also have some overlap. And so, um, in addition to looking for, very often they are they are expressed in different cell types. But if you look at their peak, they they do have significant overlap. And so sometimes, just because I see a Fox A1 having high overlap doesn't necessarily mean that this is exactly Fox A1. It could be a, another forecast, Fox A2 or Fox, some other family members. Um, and so um, in some of, uh, sometimes in the um, single cell analysis, in addition to see a peak a significant overlap, you might also want to just double check whether that transcription factor is likely to be expressed in the cell or not. If it's, like totally off in that cell type, it's unlikely to be that member. It could be a, you know, same transcription fact, factor family, uh, but a different member that's expressed. And so this one just give you the best chip seek that overlap, but the color tell you whether that gene is expressed or not in that cluster. And you probably want to have a red one rather than a a blue one, because blue one means this, this transcription factor is probably not even expressed in that cell type. Okay. Uh, sorry, one question. Mm -hmm. uh, can you clarify what does the y-axis, like peak set overlap mean? Ah, so your input peak is, uh, uh, say, uh, 100,000 peaks, right? If you just overlap with another transcription factor, chip seek with, say, 8,000 peak, that overlap is going to be very small. So that's just a, the, the overlap level. How many percentage of peak in your input that's overlapping with another chip seek? Yeah, and then why, why would they have, like, multiple points for uh, one transcription because, factor? Yes, because in the Systrom database, there might be multiple FOXA1 chip seek data available. This dot indicates the best one that overlap with your taxi. Maybe they are done in the cell type that's closer to your cell type of interest. And this is, remember, um, we mentioned the same transcription factor. If, for example, estrogen receptor is expressed in the liver, in the breast, in the ovary, in the brain, you know, like pituitary, pituitary gland. And if you look at their chip seek overlap, 
they probably only overlap 30%, depending on the tissue. And so for the same transcription factor, if it has multiple chip seek data, uh, we, we will draw all of them, but we rank them by the best one that overlap with your uh, type seek. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Thank is you. different the chip seek data for the same transcription factor. Okay, so that's a, another way to, so you can see here basically, uh, sorry, the chromovar is evaluating at the single cell level whether a motif is enriched in the peaks that has ones in that, in each single cell, right, whether it's enriched. Whereas uh, this toolkit approach, we, we don't do this at the, well, I mean, we can do this at a single cell level, but uh, it's kind of an overkill. We do this at the cluster level. If you know that this cluster have these peaks or these differential peaks, you ask what kind of transcription factor really bind to those peaks, and that will give you, you know, transcription factors. And I think they're kind of complementary. You can try different things and see which one works better. Um, and theoretically, I think chip seek data should always give you better result than just looking at motif occurrence. Okay, but that kind of give you some idea um, after you do a chip seek experiment or, or sorry, uh, a single cell attack seek experiment. You want to see what transcription factors are unique in this cell and what type of genes they might be regulating. Right. 